Michelle Leach and her husband named their second child Blair. Right after she was born and received that name, Michelle's daughter began fighting for her life. We learned that Blair actually means ready for battle. And so I very much feel that that was the Lord's providence in choosing that name for her. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Heaven Rules. For December 12, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. You know, the first six chapters of Daniel tell a lot of familiar stories. Daniel in the lion's den, the fiery furnace, the king who was humbled by God and lived like an animal. But in the last six chapters, Daniel has visions of the future, and they are terrifying. And Nancy, you write about this in your book, Heaven Rules. You show us how this hero, Daniel, becomes so afraid when he hears news of the future. Yeah, Dana. In chapter 7, Daniel says, My spirit was deeply distressed within me. And in the next chapter, he says, I was overcome and lay sick for days. And then in chapter 10, he tells us, No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale. Anguish overwhelms me, and I am powerless. All because Daniel heard news about what was coming in the future. That's right. I think we all know what that's like. In a moment, one piece of challenging news can affect our whole future. No kidding, Dana. In fact, a young woman that I've gotten to know recently named Michelle Leach had just that experience. Michelle and her husband, Mark, are related to my husband, Robert, through marriage. Right after their second child was born, Michelle and Mark received the kind of news that no parent wants to hear. I wrote about Mark and Michelle in my book, Heaven Rules, because in that moment, they had to decide, are we going to let fear overtake us, or will we take courage and take comfort knowing that God is in control? Nancy, this fits so well with your current teaching series, My Eyes Have Seen Your Salvation. When you last ended that study of Joseph and Mary in the temple, we saw how they were called to trust God with the future of their child. Michelle and Mark Leach had to do that too. So we're going to take a break from that series to explore this story. My name is Michelle Leach, and I'm from outside of Philadelphia in a little suburb called Exton. My husband and I got married in 2016, and then shortly after, we got pregnant with our oldest daughter, Charlotte. Charlotte was born, very typical child. She was, sometimes we like to call her a trick baby. She was so easy. She slept well very quickly. Charlotte was still very young. I was pregnant with our second daughter. We went to the 20-week ultrasound where we were just expecting to find out whether we were having a boy or a girl. We were having another girl, but there were also some things that they noticed on the ultrasound. They said that they found a major heart defect as well as a couple other abnormalities that encouraged them um, to kind of have us seek better care, more specialized care down at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So we started um, with the fetal heart program, but we didn't know much other than a heart defect, which would most likely require surgery when she was born. So we had a lot of scans throughout the rest of my pregnancy. We probably had echocardiograms of the baby's heart and very detailed ultrasounds. And as the scans were progressing, they were continually finding all of these abnormalities about our daughter, Blair. The doctors were really encouraging us to pursue genetic testing, um, which would put the baby at risk. And so we decided to forego, and we were very confident that whatever the results would be, it wouldn't change our desire to have the child. Um, They advised that if it would cause us to terminate the pregnancy, that we should seek answers sooner than later. And that was the point at which We really started wrestling um, for the remainder, I mean, the second half of my pregnancy. We didn't know if it was going to be a child with severe needs or if it was going to be a child that just needed a heart surgery and a problem that had a solution. And so 
that was the hardest part, that season of unknown, just crying out to the Lord that he would spare our child from having any, you know, serious issues. I think my biggest, I didn't know it until this point in my life, but that was one of my biggest fears, having a child that had genetic complications, severe cognitive, physical disabilities. That just sounded like a death sentence to me at the time. So for the remainder of our pregnancy, we continued to have scans, and she was looking healthy otherwise. And so I finally delivered her down at um, CHOP. They have a special delivery unit for high-risk babies. And when they handed her to me, and I looked at her face, I knew. I knew that there was, there was a problem. And that moment, I truly had feelings of not wanting my own daughter. And so part of my testimony is having compassion on women who do not want their child and pursue abortion. And though we knew that that was not the Lord's will, being the giver of life, I knew those emotions that might motivate someone to pursue those options. And so that was a very hard moment when she was born, not feeling like I wanted her, struggling with not even wanting to voice those feelings of feeling guilty for not wanting my own child to hear myself say that. It sounded disgusting, um, embarrassing. But that was part of the grieving process for us. And so I feel like that moment is forever ingrained in my mind of seeing her for the first time. We had trouble finding a name that was suited for this child. We decided to name her Blair. Now, we didn't know this at the time, but we found out after she had spent a lot of time in the hospital requiring heart surgery, a lot of complications, we learned that Blair actually means ready for battle. And so I very much feel that that was the Lord's providence in choosing that name for her. So when she was born, we did the genetic testing, um, which came back to reveal that she had a very rare genetic diagnosis. Um, They said there were about 300 cases in the world that were known, and it was caused by a genetic mutation, which affected every aspect of her body. So when Blair was two months old, she underwent um, open-heart surgery, And that was the same time that we sat down with the genetic doctors and learned about this diagnosis. And there was a sense of which we had answers that brought some closure, but also facing what I had said previously was my biggest fear, knowing that this child Blair was going to be severely disabled. It broke our hearts. It really broke our hearts. Like Daniel, Michelle saw a sobering picture of the future. But also like Daniel, Michelle knew a truth that became a bedrock for her soul. Heaven rules. And day by day, the Lord gave her tailor-made grace to care for that precious daughter. Here's what I wrote about Mark and Michelle in my book, Heaven Rules. We wrestled with the Lord, they admit, begging him to heal Blair and give us a daughter free of challenges. And his answer was no. Mark and Michelle are coming to see that God's no answer is not callous or random, but is actually part of his good plan for their lives. And so at that point on, the Lord really began using Blair to just pull a lot of sin to the surface of my heart, sin that had always been there, 
And so in his grace, just allowing me to see it, allowing me to see the way that I maybe idolized having this perfect family, sin in the way that I feared having a child that had disabilities, the ways that I was trying to control what my little world that was around me. Practically caring for Blair is, I often tell friends, it feels like caring for a child that has the stomach bug every day of her life. <laughs> for the first two years of her life, she was able to take a bottle, um, but it was very stressful. She was never able to nurse developmentally. She was not able to eat and breathe at the same time. So we had to work really hard to get her to take a bottle, but she had trouble latching. It would take hours to get her to latch and to take the amount she needed, and then she would throw it all up. And it was this constant cycle that felt like insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And it was stressful for myself, my husband. We were the only ones that could feed her. So we felt like we couldn't get a break. She was not gaining weight, so there was very heavy stress on her getting what she needed and keeping it down. She went through a brief period where she, during feeds, would stop breathing and she would turn very blue. And we had to call the ambulance a couple times. And this went on for close to two years. We finally made the decision to have a G-tube inserted, so now all of her feeds um, go right through her, her stomach, so she doesn't take anything by mouth. And that has been a huge blessing to us, but also to Blair. She was noticeably less stressed when she wasn't having to drink from a bottle. She was a happier girl. And so we see things like that along the way as the Lord's provision and wisdom and discernment of how to care for her. There's been a lot of trial and error with Blair of because she can't communicate in certain ways. She can't tell us how she's feeling or what's upsetting her. There's a lot of trying to figure her out. And so we've come a long way with the help of the Lord just giving us wisdom to know how to best care for her and surrounding us with people that have helped us do that. There's a lot of unknowns because her diagnosis is so rare. There's really no expectations, good or bad, which I find to be such a blessing because I don't compare Blair to other children who have her same diagnosis. I have never met another child that has her diagnosis. And I am so grateful that doctors really don't put limitations on what to expect out of her. I try to live in the daily grace that God has given and respond to her daily needs. And I feel like he really has put a hedge of protection from my thoughts of wandering down the road ahead of what ifs and will she ever. We talk a lot with our four-year-old daughter about, will Blair ever talk? Will she ever walk? Will she ever eat? I know she will one day. In September, Mark cleared out his schedule so Michelle could attend the True Woman 22 conference hosted by Revive Our Hearts. The theme of that conference was Heaven Rules. All weekend, Michelle was able to fill her mind with this truth as she prepared to head back into the battle that God has called her to in this season. Welcome to True Woman 22! The first thing that comes to mind is what a gift my husband is to me. Um, and the gift that the Lord provided in that before we even knew what our future would look like together and just knowing that He would be so capable to take care of her and allow me to get away and really just 
grow and deepen my relationship with Jesus and my mom as well. So just gratitude is the first thing that comes to mind to be able to get away. And I know that there's a lot of caretakers that aren't. It feels a little weird at times to not be on a time schedule, not be caring for a little one, um, but it feels really nice. Believing that heaven rules will transform the way that you think about everything. It will transform the way that you live. I think this whole theme of heaven rules has been really on my heart. The last couple years, I think the Lord has been using things in my life to point my gaze upward toward eternity. And that just reminder that heaven rules does really allow everything else to pale in comparison, regardless of trials here on earth. It just really puts them in the proper perspective. So just having those reminders, and I got Nancy's book and I tried to finish it before the conference. I feel like it's one of those books where I'm going to need to read it every year to just reorient my heart. God is always working out His purposes in this world for the glory of His name. In 1 Peter 1, he talks about being grieved by various trials, if necessary. And so having that perspective that this trial was necessary for the Lord to refine my heart, to become more like Jesus, and to remember that He is on this work to completely sanctify me, that will not be finished until we reach heaven, but to know that this is intentional by the Lord. He is using every moment, every difficulty to make me more into a picture of my Savior. First Peter 1, verse 6 through 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In 2 Corinthians 4, it talks about viewing these trials as light momentary afflictions compared to an eternal way of glory. And being able to look to the things that are unseen and not focusing on the things that are seen on this earth, which tend to capture our gaze so heavily, that verse has really helped me lift my eyes um, and remember that heaven rules. And so the Lord started really working in this heaven rules theme of these days that Blair has on earth are a light momentary affliction. And so lifting my eyes to eternity when Blair's body will be perfected in heaven. And just knowing that when, when we get to those days, looking back, these days on earth will just seem so short. And so the Lord really turned my heart to be able to see Blair as a means of grace in my life. He used her to help me to entrust not only her being so medically fragile at the time, but also my other daughter, just entrusting them to him. They were gifts that he had given me. And my desire is to be a good steward of those gifts. But just knowing that they are not mine and they are his that just brought a lot of freedom to know that he loves them more than I ever could and he cares for them more than I ever could. And knowing those two truths together, how could I not trust him with these two daughters and future children? We now have three, three daughters. And so I feel this sense of freedom walking in the fact that 
I don't need to feel this weight of trying to control. And, you know, when you have kids, there's so many opportunities to fear. There's so many things to be afraid of for your children. And I feel like the Lord taught me that lesson so early, and I'm so grateful. I'm sure it's going to be a lifelong lesson as my children grow older and the things that I fear might become bigger and more um, significant perhaps, but I think that the Lord will bring these things to mind and help me. So I feel like I'm a different mom, frankly, than when my first daughter was born. And now with Blair, Praise God. She is really thriving. She's very medically stable right now. The Lord has provided for us in so many different ways with um, just family and therapists that love her and have become part of our family, it feels like at times. And he's given us faith to have more kids. You know, we have another daughter who just turned one. And I look at Blair, and I was saying this to my mom the other day. I. I can't picture my life without her. And a daughter that I thought I never could fully love the way that I love my other children, I can truly say that she is a gift from God and I love her. And so the Lord has really used Blair in a mighty way in my life. In the year 2023, there's a good chance that you'll experience many joyful moments, and there's also a good chance you'll hear some bad news. Like Mark and Michelle Leach, things might not go according to your plan. When those storms come, how will you know your anchor will hold? That's why Revive Our Hearts reminds you of the truth each weekday. We want to help fill your mind and your soul with the truth that never changes. We want you to be prepared when storms roll in, and they will. We want to point you day after day to the anchor that truly holds. And we're able to do that thanks to listeners like you who support this ministry and make it possible. Each year, almost half of the donations that we need for the entire year are given during the month of December. Now, these are uncertain days for all of us, humanly speaking. I get that. But if you're able and the Lord prompts you, your gift at this time will make a big difference. It'll help make sure that we can continue providing solid, timeless truth that you can count on in 2023 and beyond. Some friends of this ministry believe in this mission so much that they've offered to double each gift that's given during the month of December as part of a matching challenge. What a wonderful provision that is from the Lord. It means that Any gift you give this month will be doubled, doubled financially, but also doubled in its impact and the women we can reach. So would you take a minute to ask yourself, how has God used Revive Our Hearts to anchor me to the truth when the storms of life were swirling around? And how would He want me to help keep its ministry outreaches going? and make sure that these resources are available for others who need them. You can make your donation by visiting reviveourhearts.com. When you're there, you can watch a video our team made with our guest, Michelle Leach. You can also support the ministry by calling 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. Oh, it's easy to just read the Christmas story in the Bible and forget these were real people with real struggles. But we just heard Michelle Leach weep over her daughter's future. Do you realize Mary felt deeply about the future of her baby, Jesus? Tomorrow, Nancy will help you recognize Mary's sacrifice. We'll pick back up in the series, My Eyes Have Seen Your Salvation. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts.
Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss-Walgamuth is calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.